All right, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Richmond Peace Education Center after dinner conversation. My name is Thad Williamson. I'm the moderator for this evening, and it's gonna be a conversation concerning uh, the General Assembly session you know, at, at the State House here in, in Richmond. And our, our guest tonight is you know, one of the top political analysts you know, in, in the state of, of Virginia, Bob Holdsworth who was um, founding director of the Center for Public Policy and the Wilder School of Government at Virginia Commonwealth University, as well as you know, a variety of other roles uh, in, in academia and, and public service and consulting around town. I'm gonna to use my privilege to call attention to three facts. Maybe not everybody knows. One is that he's the author of one of the best books ever about the city of Richmond, Affirmative Action, an installed quest for black progress, which covers the city of Richmond in the 1980s and early 1990s, written with his colleague, uh, uh, Avon Drake, which is really an excellent book and something I learned a lot when I came from when I came to Richmond. Secondly, he's author of the best book ever on the Richmond Peace Education Center, uh, which is a, a, a book uh, called, um, get the title right, Let My Life, Sorry, let your, I apologize, let your life speak, a study of politics, religion, and anti-nuclear weapons. And I, I've read most of that book as, as well. It received an excellent review in the Journal of American History. And it's a very uh, searching, but also not uncritical uh, examination of the, the folks who started the Peace Center and the, the work they did, their methodology, the, their way of thinking about the world, and more importantly, how to change it, and, and, and including some of the people on, on this call tonight. So it's really a special book, and if you haven't read it, it's worth going back and, and looking at it. And thirdly, I will want to highlight the fact that, that Bob is uh, received his doctorate at the best university in, in the entire world, University of North Carolina, at, at Chapel Hill. So uh, that's that. Said, you know, thank you, Bob. Welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. Okay, I appreciate it, and I should um, just mention, as far as that last note went. Uh, I think when I was in graduate school, uh, my office was in Hamilton Hall, and I think I walked past your father's office every day. So, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you, you really <laughs> likely did. And in fact, the uh, elevator uh, in that building is actually officially named after him because he managed to get fixed after like twelve years of dysfunction. <laughs> One of his last acts in Chapel Hill. But anyway, a little inside baseball there. But but anyway, again, th thanks for being here. And, and um, you know, the first question. Uh, just to get us rolling is, could you share with us where we are in the entire process? And we had the veto session today. Maybe not everyone fully understands what that means, what happens. So where are we, are we in the process? What has been done? Uh, what happened today? What remains to be done in order to wrap up the session? Sure. Um, today is um, kind of colloquially called the veto session. And uh, at one time, what happened in uh, Virginia, gen Virginia politics, the General Assembly would meet, they would do all of their business, they would send it to the governor, and the governor would have this opportunity to um, veto legislation. They would come back um, you know, sometime after they left town, the governor had his duty, and this would be the final day of the session. Um, that's not gonna happen this time. And there's a couple of things that I want to mention on, on this. Uh, the first is that this notion of a, a veto session is, is, is accurate, but, but not complete. Uh, because there are two things that a governor can do in Virginia that are worth noting. One is that, um, as many executives, they can veto legislation. And the governor even has what they call a line item veto power in Virginia. So that's pretty important. And so the assembly has to come back and decide if he's vetoed any legislation, what they're going to do with it. And to overturn a veto, they need uh, two thirds of the members of both houses to overturn a veto. Um, for the most part today, with uh, I, I've seen one exception so far, almost all of the governor's vetoes are being upheld by the Republicans in the House, um, including people who even voted for some of the legislation the first time around. And um, perhaps two of the uh, more, um, ones that are becoming more visible today 
is there was one piece of legislation that would require um, that was agreed upon by uh, tenant right organizations and and landlord organizations, first uh, the apartment managers associations, um, that would have made it um, that, that would have given tenants more opportunities to um, ensure that they're not evicted and things of that sort. Um, that was agreed upon by both of these folks. Uh, it received, I think, at least 17 votes in, in the House from Republicans per se. So it passed with about a two thirds majority. Uh, but when the governor vetoed it, the role of Republicans got in line today and they upheld the veto there. And that received a um, pretty scathing denunciation from a Democratic legislator from Newport News who proposed. Uh, the legislation in the first place, Chia Price, and that's probably worthwhile to um, to look at actually to see her her her, her uh, speech on the floor about that. And the second piece of legislation uh, that was almost unanimous actually uh, was one that would have uh, prevented people from being done for medical debt after three years, and again that was um, that w during the session. It was approved almost unanimously in both the House and the Senate. The governor vetoed it, and today the House refused to um, overrule the veto. So th those items will get there. So, but the governor has this veto power because he has uh, enough Republicans in the um, in, in the House, and he even has enough Republicans in the Senate. Not too many of his vetoes are going to be overturned unless Republicans go along with it in both houses. Um, on that front. Um, that's not all that different from what typically happens in Virginia. Uh, Terry McAuliffe, even when he had a Republican House, was able to veto legislation and he had enough Democrats in the Senate, even when, when the Republican controlled the Senate as well, he had enough Democrats in the Senate to make sure that most of his vetoes uh, were sustained as well. Uh, but the second power the governor has which is an unusual power, not held by every governor in the country, is that the governor, when legislation comes to him, not only does he have the opportunity to either sign it or veto it, he has the opportunity in Virginia to amend it, to change it. Sometimes those changes are um, what they call technical in nature. They're, they're, they're changes that actually make the legislation a little better. It might've been passed hurriedly, and when the governor's legal counsels get to it, they, they make it better. Uh, but um, in a lot of instances here, what has happened is that the governor uses uh, the legislation and, and actually changes it with the amendment. So the governor in Virginia has this sort of added power. At the end of the day, he comes in almost as a uh, 11th hour legislator and can and can can do put legislation forward and the importance of that as well is that that legislation doesn't necessarily go to back to committees it goes directly to the floor of both chambers and sometimes um that's a real opportunity for the governor to get something done that he might not have got done um through the committee process and so right now that's what's happening as well. The governor has sent down over a hundred amendments to legislation, some of them fairly controversial. Uh, perhaps the most controversial one of all is one where in um, Loudoun County, they had just asked for a bill that would enable them to stagger the election terms of their school board. So rather than electing the school board all at once, Loudoun County said, let us stagger the terms starting um, uh, I think this year or next year, and then we would stagger the terms throughout. The governor amended that legislation to say that he wanted all the members of Loudoun County School Board to stand for election this November. And, and what that was about, that was a, an effort that had almost, I think, nothing to do with Virginia and uh, far more to do with a, a national profile. Because if you had watched the election cycle, the governor had been interested in um, um, 
using Loudoun County as sort of this sort of cultural trope of uh, what was wrong with Virginia because of its Virginia education, because of its commitment to critical race theory. Um, not that I think, uh, I think there's an open question of whether Loudoun County actually was teaching it or embraced it, um, but the governor used it. It was picked up by Fox News. It became kind of a national uh, issue. And so this notion of putting the entire Loudoun County school board up for election is really um, more of a play for a national audience than it is for Virginia, because while it was approved by the House, I think later this evening it will be uh, denied by the Senate. Um, there, because they, they simp the amendments um, have to get majority approval in both houses, and I really doubt that it's going to get majority approval in the Senate. And I think what you're going to see is that in the Senate, on all of the governor's amendments, they're going to calculate whether it's worthwhile to go along with the amendment or whether uh, it's better off to simply have him veto the bill um, after it gets sent back to him uh, without the amendment. But in any case, that, that's what's going on now. You have those two things happening. However, and I make things more complicated, typically in the past, so this has not been the case over the last 10 or 15 years all the time. Um, they would also be dealing with the budget. But right now what has happened is that the Senate and the House don't have a budget. Um, they're about $3 billion apart, and they are apart largely because there is a very uh, strong disagreement, strong difference of opinion about how much they should support the governor's tax cut proposals where the Republicans are pretty uniformly, but not entirely in the Senate in favor of them, um, but particularly in the House they are, um, where in the Senate, um, there is there's clear reservations about going along with some of his tax cut proposals. So they haven't done that yet. So what this means is that what normally would be the end of the session is really just the beginning of the end, because they still have to come back with a budget that is a piece of legislation, actually. So the governor has the opportunity to amend or veto part of that. And then they'll have to come back after they pass the budget, they'll have to come back a second time and they'll have to deal with the governor's amendments and vetoes. And they'll be fair, they have the potential of being fairly substantial in the budget as well. So it's going to be a while um, before anything ends here. And um, probably the, the people most concerned about this tend to be local governments right now because their budget year starts July 1 and they're a little uncertain about what's going to happen, let us say, with education funding from the state. So I'm sorry for the long-winded answer. Uh, that, that's great. And thank you for the, the, the detail and the nuance. And you know, and, and just so everybody knows, uh, Bob and I had agreed uh, on sort of a slate of questions in advance. Uh, I may consolidate some of them in the interest of time so that we have time to, for, for any questions, you know, from, from, from anyone else in the last few minutes. But, but so let me just consolidate, you know, th these questions into one, you know, from the governor's point of view, what was he trying to achieve in this session, do you think, and how happy is he with how it's gone? And conversely, from the Democratic perspective, what, what has been their goal and how happy are they to this point of, about mm. how things play out? Yeah, the governor has, um, you know, sort of multiple agendas. Um, you know, his biggest agenda probably was these tax cuts that he wanted passed um, and that he sort of extended recently by asking for a gas tax holiday. Uh, what the governor wanted to do was he wanted to um, eliminate the, uh, the grocery tax. Uh, that was something that actually probably had been proposed in the past far more by Democrats than Republicans because they've always thought that was a regressive tax. It, it harmed poor people more than it did. Uh, poor people paid a greater proportion of their income on groceries than rich people did. Um, and given that there was some money, um, there was going to be an almost elimination of the grocery tax. I think some Democrats in the Senate know that some of that money is used for transportation and local things that they didn't, education that they didn't want to get rid of. Um, but by and large, that will probably, they can reach an agreement on that. Um, the big disagreement on taxes 
is, however, is the governor wants to basically um, double the standard deduction on the Virginia income tax. And, that, and that's where much of this $3 billion difference is. Um, and he wants to make that universal, apply to everyone. And the Democrats think that's just kind of foolish um, because by and large, um, what they would prefer to do is to provide an earned income tax credit to lower income folks and not necessarily uh, reduce taxes even more um, on middle and upper middle and, and, and wealthy individuals in Virginia because the Democrats believe that Virginians, um, there's a big difference of opinion. The governor says that Virginians are overtaxed and the Democrats think we're kind of in the middle of the country and maybe even a little lower there and that there are things that um, have to be done with the dollars such as um, make improvements in education funding where we're below uh, national averages and things like teacher salaries um, as well. So there's a big difference there. So the governor wants that done. That's op an open question. There'll be some compromise there, but the governor is not going to get everything he wants. And the Democrats may have to budge a little more than they want. Um, that's sort of, I think, the, the, the big item that the governor had in front of them. Um, beyond that, you have these cultural issues that are up there um, about education. Um, some cultural, some organizational. The governor wants more charter schools. The Democrats are reluctant. They think that um, charter schools take money away from the public school system and divert, it, divert money and that they have uh, very mixed records uh, as well. Uh, Virginia is a state that despite being fairly conservative for most of its history, doesn't have many charter schools. Uh, there are some liberal places like D.C. and Maryland that have far more charters than Virginia. Um, governor wants to do that. The Democrats are kind of reluctant. They'll agree to give some money to universities to start what they call lab schools, but they're a little reluctant to go down the charter school route. So that's the second thing. And then there's this tremendous division about this whole notion of divisive concepts, teaching about critical race theory, um, and... This is really where um, the governor is getting a lot of national attention, and I don't think that's going away uh, anytime soon. In terms of the Democrats, um, you know, what they wanted to do in this session is mostly play defense. They mostly wanted to simply um, keep the gains that they have, and they've basically said the sen what they're trying to do is have the Senate be a brick wall against various Republican efforts to roll back what they consider to be the progress and to roll back and, and to promote uh, the agenda of Governor Yunkin that is in opposition to what the Democrats want. And so um, basically what we're at in Virginia is a situation that's not that different we've been in for most of the past 20 years, where we have a governor of one party and we have a, another party, and this time uh, the Democrats, this is, we reverse the situation a little bit. Um, in which the uh, legislative branch controlled by the other party is attempting to be a break uh, on what they consider to be the excesses of the governor. Great, thank you. So I, I'm intrigued by your um, comment that you don't think the critical race theory issue is going away as, as such. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. I mean, because to some of us, it may have felt like this is just a, a ridiculous campaign stunt that somehow caught a fire at the right time. And, and you know, McAuliffe made a couple of unwise statements that, you know, helped give it legs. And then you had also um, the concern by some people about the pandemic response and, and that the schools have been closed for too long and all sorts of stuff. So we're playing into kind of a, 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 you know, set the free kids kind of agenda and empower their par parents. And then with the race thrown on top of it, but you seem to be suggesting that this is a good issue for him in terms of his national profile. And so how do you think that will play out in practice, especially if he can't get everything he wants to, uh, you know, the General Assembly, what else can he do to advance that? And how yeah. do you think the Democrats might respond? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good point because, um, you know, essentially, um, 
there's a lot of things governors can do that don't, they don't have to do legislatively. That they can do administratively in some fashion. So the um, decision-making power in the um, educational, um, the, the official decision-making power in education in Virginia is the Board of Education, which is appointed by the governor. Um, and many of these appointees right now are appointees of Ralph Northam. Um, but what happened was that Northam renewed the appointment of several members of that, of that board. And typically, uh, sort of a perfunctory renewal, the legislature actually has to confirm board appointments. And when the Democrats didn't confirm the appointment of um, Andrew Wheeler as the secretary for the um, <clears throat> you know, natural resources, the environmental issue, um, the Republicans and the governor refused to confirm the last batch of Northern appointees to the Board of Education. And that gave the governor the opportunity to make these interim appointments to the Board of Education. And the essence is that what would have taken him two years to get a majority on the Board of Education, he's now done in one year. Um, beyond that, the governor has the power to appoint the superintendent of state and of schools in the state. And if you saw what he did there was that he appointed a, a person who came in um, from Wyoming. Um, and this was an interesting appointment to me because Wyoming is a state that has, uh, I think, a lower than 1% point uh, African-American population there. So, uh, and then they have done this so-called study of equity and divisive concepts and have already started talking about what they want to remove uh, from the curriculum. And you're starting to see this. You're starting to see school boards uh, in Virginia looking a little bit like school boards in Florida in terms of looking at textbooks and saying that they're, you know, that they're divisive in some ways. And so um, you may have been looking at this one, Thad, that um, there's a textbook that's used like throughout America. Um, and the cover of, and, and it's written by a couple of fairly prominent political scientists who um, I don't know if they have, I don't even know what their political viewpoint is um, over time. But the cover of the book had some protesters and Black Lives Matter signs and the like. And already there's been at least one county in Virginia that has removed that book that said that they're not going to use that book to teach um, civics and government. Um, and so the question then becomes, <coughs> you know, the governor says, well, I'm not trying to prevent anything. I want to teach the good and the bad. But the question is, how do you do that? What do you say? And um, it's a challenge for civics teachers. And, you know, my, um, I've worked with civics teachers across Virginia um, for multiple years. And this has been an odd thing because I, I, I don't see many of them teaching anything that would be resembling, you know, a legal theory of critical race theory. I think they're you know, trying to teach civics and engagement and, and Virginia history as, as, as well as they can. And I'm not saying they make mistakes at times, and nor would I say that some of the, you know, training materials that have been used, um, you know, are, are in some ways not the best materials as well. But by and large, when I look at the teachers, they're out there trying to do a great job. And what I worry about, I think, more than anything, is that some of them are, are, are a little worried now. Uh, they're worried that if they, um, you know, talk about the actual history of Virginia, uh, particularly in the 40s and the 50s, when you're talking about um, uh, massive resistance and, um, you know, we had a textbook commission actually in 1948 um, that rewrote textbooks to try to ensure that uh, slavery was treated as something that was um, fairly benign in Virginia uh, compared, to, uh, compared to other states. And so some of these teachers, I think, are a little worried that if they teach what they've typically been teaching, they might wind up uh, with, you know, protests to the school board and, and things of that sort. So. Um, it worries me that in Virginia, we might wind up in, 
you know, moving in that direction a little bit. I don't, I haven't seen uh, great evidence that we are, but it, it, it certainly, I think it's doing that. The other thing that's going to happen is that school board elections and most school boards are elected in Virginia are going to become far more highly politicized. They're going to become in many of these communities less about who is on the PTA, who, who, who has shown real interest in schools and parents and going to be sort of stepping stones to political careers as well. So um, that's the challenge. And from the governor's perspective, um, this helped him get elected. I think they overestimate how much it helped him get elected. I, I really think the parental discontent had very little to do with critical race theory, had much more to do with the debacle of remote learning uh, that occurred in the public schools throughout Virginia. They just were unprepared for it. And even though they tried their best, uh, parents were just, you know, coping with the pandemic, coping with job issues, and then having a, a sort of an education system that just didn't work for a year or 18 months. Um, and I think the Governor Yunkin captured that frustration very well in his campaign. Uh, the Democrats seemed to ignore it, and it, it helped elect Republicans. However, I'm a little worried about where we may go, and there may be an what I would call, um, you know, sort of an overreading of the mandate about this. And we may wind up with some real um, problems in the school system about race. And let me just mention one other thing that, that's related to this that, that concerns me. And that is the, um, this is being really linked to this whole ocean notion that the Democrats are really overly woke. And this issue is starting to hit uh, with the treatment of uh, gay, lesbian, and transgender students uh, in the classrooms. And that is really a, um, uh, you know, a potential tragedy in my mind because some of these kids are really struggling um, to try to, um, you know, kind of understand who they are. And if they wind up being um, hit by uh, and harmed by uh, local policies, uh, uh, I'll regret if that happens there. I, I would uh, just ask everybody, I don't know if anybody's seen uh, the letter that the Republican governor of Utah wrote when they were trying to, um, in, in Utah, pass legislation about uh, transgender kids in sports. And he wrote this extraordinary letter at the end of it. He said, I have three numbers. He said 75,000, four, and 56. And he says 75,000 are the number of kids in, in Utah playing high school sports. He said four is the number of trans kids. He said three of them are trans boys. Um, and he said in 56 is the percentage of uh, transgender teenagers who have considered suicide. And this governor wrote that he said, you know, um, these are four kids, he said, are trying to have some friends uh, and trying to have a life. He said, and I want them to live, and I don't understand why we're passing this kind of legislation. Um, and um, it would be passed in Virginia if the Democrats weren't in the Senate. Yeah, well, that's a powerful letter. Thank you for, you know, for, for sharing that. And, and um, you know, it's just a, a quick follow-up. I mean, how would you assess the Democrats' response to either the critical race theory issues so-called um or this you know forthcoming possible attack on lgbt issues um because it seems like sort of just sort of saying we don't teach you know harvard law school curriculum in our schools that kind of technical response didn't really seem to cut mustard in the end but I yeah, what well yeah yeah i mean I, well I would say i think the democrats for one reason or another you know as i said i, I think they missed what people cared about in some ways in the last election. Yeah. Um, I think they missed any discussion of, you know, any acknowledgement that this remote learning was just, a, just didn't work in a lot of places, particularly in places where either the parents weren't technologically sophisticated or where um, there wasn't even internet or broadband um, in some places. They just got killed in those places. Um, that was one thing. I think they didn't understand. They didn't make much acknowledgement that inflation was becoming an issue for people and that they were 
They were struggling with, um, despite wage increases, they were struggling economically. And then in terms of some of these hot button issues, um, as you said, just saying they didn't there, um, you know, we don't teach it. I, I think that you need to have like an upfront discussion about what you're going to teach. Um, you know, here, here's what we're about. Um, you know, we want to teach sort of uh, a complete history that does these things. Um, and from my, what I can see in public opinion polls, actually the majority of the public is, is, is in favor of it. And, but I think the Democrats have to do a better job of telling people what's at stake. Now, um, where the public is on um, the um, transgender kids, particularly in their participation in sports, that's a different story in terms of public opinion right now. Um, that's a long way from where the public has gone, let us say, on, on gay marriage um, there. And, and that's more of a, a hot button issue. It's more of a challenge. It, it, it impacts a smaller number of people. Um, but, it, but a lot of these school board meetings where you get hundreds of people showing up weren't simply about critical race theory. It has been about um, transgender kids and transgender participation in sports and bathroom bills and things of that sort. Um, um, and, you know, and it's unfortunate in my mind, but that, that's kind of where we are. And I'm not sure the Democrats have had a, a, a great response to that yet. Great. Uh, thank you. So, um, you know, looking at the governor and, you know, his term more broadly, where else do you see that he and also the attorney general are likely to make a direct impact on policy and practice, both within the agencies and obviously the enforcement of law. And, and what, what have they done already that maybe we haven't caught on to? And what do you see is likely to happen? Well, over the uh, well, the attorney general, um, very different perspective, maybe 180 degrees different from, from Mark Herring, who is interested in um, uh, to some degree social agenda on uh, equal rights, also interested in, um, you know, you had Democrats passing laws um, prohibiting the death penalty, um, you know, legalizing marijuana, trying to um, look at sentence disparities. Um, and I think uh, Jason Mayeris was elected on a, on a much different platform, on a platform that was more sort of traditional Republican platform of, you know, let, you know, we have a crime wave that's, that, that's emerging, um, that Democratic leaders have not said anything about it, um, that they have um, been too complacent while um, crime is rising. They have, um, in some ways, ignored victims. And um, by and large, that message um, is one where Republicans are, are, are moving right now. Um, and again, it, it, it's part of the same argument that's been made that the Democratic Party moved too far to the left, that the Democratic Party became the sort of woke party. And all of these things are, are of a piece in some way, um, that they you know, don't care about traditional values, that they, by and large, um, you know, can't even, def you know, can't even define like the, um, what a woman is, you know, if you look at the uh, confirmation hearings for, for Judge Jackson, um, and that uh, by and large, uh, you know, they are allowing this sort of crime wave to uh, take place unimpeded in, uh, in many areas. Um, and that is, that is an argument that's getting some traction um, in all likelihood. Uh, it's hard to imagine how the Democrats hold on to their um, majority in the House of Representatives right now. And um, I think the Senate may be a different story, but on the other hand, if a president's approval rating is you know, 15 points underwater, that, that's gonna be tough even holding on to the Senate. So. That, that's kind of where it is uh, right now. And, and in Virginia, I think uh, you certainly have a very clear distinction with the attorney general who 
um, by and large is arguing that in fact local prosecutors have not been aggressive enough in prosecuting crime, though he is paying a little bit of, um, I think, of taking a public hit right now to some degree um, by overturning uh, the grand jury indictment of those police officers, the park police up in, uh, up in Northern Virginia. And the Democrats are saying, well, um, he cares about victims only if they're the right kind of victims um on that sense but by and large uh i think the uh, that is one of the big changes that occurred in virginia with this election now the democrats because they have control of the senate have been able to um be obstacles to legislative activities uh that might repeal significant parts of the reforms they put in um, but at the same time, administratively, there's going to be, I think, a very clear difference of opinion, you know, sort of distinction that's coming forward. And largely because my areas believe this is, this, this is what he campaigned on. He was very upfront about it. Um, and he, he won a fairly significant victory and he, and he's going to pursue it. Thank you. So, um, you, you remarked earlier that to sort of state the obvious, but it is still worth saying that if not for the Democrats and the Senate, you know, this would be a very different conversation. So looking ahead to, to, to next year in Virginia, how does the fact that, you know, Governor Youngkin is clearly like a national figure in GOP circles is being talked about as a candidate for the future, maybe near or, 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 or not too far anyway, how does all that potentially impact the dynamic in terms of the elections next year? Yeah, I mean, that, that it's hard to say. I mean, usually if you're running for president while you're governor, that doesn't help. Um, you know, you're only elected to one you know, four-year term at a time here in Virginia, and that, that has never been something that Virginians have looked at um, tremendously. I think, I don't think the dynamic has changed very much in Virginia since the election. Um, and a lot of people misread what happened in that election. Um, what, what happened to some degree was um, a, a lot of it was connected to what occurred nationally, that Virginia reflects a lot of these national trends these days. And as the president's ratings went down among independents, so did Terry McAuliffe um, on that front. And then beyond that, there is a sense that there was this tremendous suburban change that occurred in this election, and it didn't. Uh, at least it didn't in Northern Virginia and in uh, RVA very much. Um, you know, if I had told you the day before the election that compared to when he won in 2013 against Ken Cuccinelli, Terry McAuliffe was going to run better in 2021 in, in Henrico, Chesterfield, Fairfax, Prince William, and Loudoun, almost everyone would say he couldn't lose this election. Um, That's literally, I, I ran those numbers too. I, 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 that's literally what I thought, you know, and I didn't see what happened. You know, so what happened was that, which called Rova, what I call like the rest of Virginia. Um, he didn't run as well in Northern, in, in Hampton Roads, that was for sure. But what occurred was that sort of this cultural divide that you're seeing in the country has hit so strongly now that uh, what you found is that in places where Democrats used to get 30% of the vote, they get 19% of the vote. You go all the way up the valley in Virginia, you go in the southwest, south side, with the exception of some localities where you have uh, heavy African-American populations. Um, the, the cultural divide is so strong and I think it's partially related to media and me, uh, sort of uh, what you what you read and what you what you see. Um, Democrats just you know people are just simply not identifying with issues or part persons or whatever. They're just not one of them any longer. They, and so um, what happened is that throughout the rest of Virginia, McCall was getting you know, 20% in some of these places. You know, you go to what I call the Liberty University suburbs outside of um, Lynchburg and Bedford and Campbell uh, and Amherst, just destruction for the Democrats. So 
that that's a big problem that they face is that um they hadn't thought that the sort of non-metro big metro areas could harm them very much and, and and i thought that too for a while i thought like there are no more republican votes left to harvest in these places but there were um and it's related to i think just the sort of broader identities that people have so um as I said, there was all this attention to Loudoun County. McCall did much better in Loudoun County in 2021 than he did in 2013. He got more, Ken Cuccinelli in a three-way race in 2013 had a higher percentage of the vote in Loudoun, Prince William and Fairfax than Glenn Youngkin. There was no big change there. Um, but what changed is this sort of, this polarization hit. And the second thing that occurred and Youngkin's campaign deserves credit for that, is that they did a much better job of mobilizing their people, um, the people who were going to vote for him, than the Democrats did. That um, because, elect, because it was easier to vote in Virginia because of the reforms the Democrats made, this, this election had a much higher turnout than recent gubernatorial elections. And there was a higher turnout everywhere but the highest, but the turnout was higher in Republican leaning areas. The growth was higher than it was in Democratic leaning areas. So it tells you that Republicans did a better job of mobilizing their voters than the Democrats did. And um, they deserve credit for that. And the Democrats failed in that regard. Uh, thank you. So w one last question, and, and it also relates to, to the, the question that's been put in the chat that I'll ask, and then, then we can open it up uh, you know, to the floor. But um, is related to you know, the, the problem engaging rural voters, obviously, but also just more generally. And for those who didn't see the the the, the Democratic uh, House delegates basically change their leadership, uh, and, and, and from my understanding, response to the election results in part. Um, what would you recommend to Democrats in order to try to alter that dynamic? you know, over, over, you know, the next couple of elections, the, the one you just described? Yeah, well, um, you know, part of that, as I said, is, um, you know, I, I tend to think these elections in Virginia get increasingly nationalized, um, even at the local levels. And um, people don't like to hear that. They don't like to believe it. Um, I remember when the Democrats did very successful, were very successful in 2017. And I gave a number of presentations and said, you know, there was a, there was a huge Trump effect here in Virginia, because he's unpopular in Virginia. And all the Democratic candidates would say, no, 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 with us. Uh, you know, we knocked on doors, we did great things. Um, we, we, we were energetic, we were active, and they were. They were very good candidates, they did all good things. Um, and, um, but they were helped by this, <laughs> you know, John O'Bannon wouldn't have lost in Henrico County if it wasn't for Trump. Um, you know, he would have won. Um, there was no, there was no, you know, this, this wasn't a, uh, you know, an effort to remove John O'Bannon. <laughs> it was an effort for people, the Democrats wanted to come out and make any statement they could. And so that's what's happening, that people are making these statements. Um, so, um, you know, overall, um, I think the, um, the Democratic Party needs a better message right now um, about, you know, you know, how they are going to work to improve people's lives. And, um, you know, and that message has to be as positive as well as negative about the Republicans. I mean, McCall's message was ultimately too negative, I think, um, on that front. Um, but that is going to depend not simply on what happens here. It's going to depend on, you know, the Democrats being able to do that um, more positively in the national level. And whether they can do that is, is an open question. I mean, I think they're um, the most damning problem they face now uh, with President Biden is a, the, the significant portion of independents don't believe that he's mentally up for the job. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, maybe if, you know, inflation goes down, he'll, you know, he'll benefit 
but I've thought he's done a, you know, a relatively good job in keeping the sort of allies together in, in the, um, in the Ukrainian war with Russia, but that hasn't, that hasn't translated into anything, at least at the moment, publicly in these, in this polling. So, you know, I think Democrats need a better message. They need better messengers and they need people who are, um, you know, people who are identified with cert, with with things. You know, with 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 good things that that help the public. And you know, I, I often talk about that. That um, a lot of people say to me, "Well, if the Democrats nominated Jennifer McClellan verse rather than um, Terry McAuliffe, would have been different." Um, I don't believe it um, because I think, as uh, you know, maybe four years from now it would be different. Um, but at the moment, I think Jennifer McClellan was somebody who was very well liked by Democrats, that she was seen as inside the Democratic Party, that she's beloved, um, but she's not identified out in the community with this issue or that issue or, 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 or something that's really important to people. And that's what I think they need. I think they need some people who, who, take, who take issues or who are, who are known for it and who can... Um, make a case with the public that way. Thank you very much. Um, and that reminds me of the conclusion to your book on the Peace Center <laughs> in which you called for more political engagement <laughs> uh, and for people to, you know, be willing to get in there. Uh, but but, but I, I, those are really interesting comments. So. Um, Naeem, I, I don't know if your question has already been answered, but if you would like to speak, you know, please do, or I can just restate it, the question. Okay. So the, the, the question, if you didn't see it, Bob, is has the Democratic Party really moved to the left overall or only on the issues that get a lot of publicity? Yeah, I mean, in, in Virginia, um, the Democratic Party is um, more left than it was at one time um, in terms of what I would call the, um, probably the, uh, more so the, the white progressives. Um, there's more, you know, you have people not taking Dominion resource money and the like. Um, and, and that's mostly centered, not entirely, but mostly in Northern Virginia, not probably a little more so than it is around here. Um, I think with most African-American leaders, they, they tend to be a little more um, pragmatic and they tend to, uh, the issues that they care about that some people are saying are left are really issues of just sort of basic fairness um, that I'm not sure really is left or right, you know, is a left issue that, you know, um, you want to be treated fairly by the criminal justice system um, that, I, that I don't, I don't see that as sort of a, a major left, left notion, but it certainly portrayed that way, um, to, um, <clears throat> to, an, to an audience by, um, the opposition media to them on that way, which is, you know, constantly beaten that the Democrats have moved so far to the left that they've gotten, they've gotten out, you know, that it's been different um and, it, and it's hurting them i mean there's no doubt about that um it's hurt them i think in virginia um but at the same time you know the democrats have to think about um how they over time try to begin to address this in some of the places that it's hurting so you know the other thing that the democrats have to address is um the disengagement from politics by um, younger people in some of the groups that support them in large majorities. Um, so on one hand, you really see that um, you've seen uh, a lot of disengagement. Um, it hasn't gone over to the Republican side dramatically in the African-American community, but among um, a lot of young African Americans. What we're seeing is that they're they're not sure the political system works for them one way or the other, and they're less be, become less involved in some fashion. Um, the Democrats, I think, have been overly complacent about their support in the 
uh, Hispanic Latino communities, um, which is by no means an inherently liberal community um, on that way. Um, and so, you know, conservative on some social issues, um, sometimes, uh, you know, certainly uh, what we've seen in some states is uh, Republicans speaking about socialism has been a um, very powerful motivator, um, you know, certainly in Florida, but maybe in Texas as well, not so much in some other states, but, um, you know, the Democrats, you know, a, a little bit of erosion there has harmed them tremendously in states like Florida and has prevented them from making the uh, gains that they thought they could make demographically in, in, in Texas. So, uh, I mean, that's another, uh, an, another ongoing challenge for the Democrats is to really um, begin to develop the kind of support that they have with some um, older uh, folks in uh, minority groups among young people. And we're seeing some erosion, if, if not necessarily abandonment of the Democrats to the other party, though that's occurred a little bit, we're seeing much more just detachment from the Democrats. Thank you. Um, go, ahead, go ahead, John. Huh. Uh, where do you see the environment and ecology fitting in all of this? Is this just the concern of the liberal suburban group or is is it a real issue? Uh, it, it, it's an issue, but I mean, it, it, you know, it, you know, the question is where does it, where does it play and how, how strong is it? I, I, yeah, I used to do a lot of polling for um, a Virginia environmental endowment. And, um, you know, polling always showed that people were extraordinarily concerned, they said about the environment, they didn't think we were moving in the right direction. Um, but I never could see why, how it made a that much of a political impact. I think it has an impact among young people. I think that's one place where, uh, particularly among young whites um, of college, you know, who are in college and college, college educated and above, that, that that's, a, that's a big issue. And you see that with the tech companies, you know, that are, you know, wanting, um, you know, ultimately to be powered by renewables um, wherever they're building data centers and things like that. So, and they're appealing to their workforce. Um, it, you know, I think that's what that's about um, in some fashion. So I, I, I think that issue is there, but it always kind of gets, you know, you then have to counter the notion about, you know, is it, um, is it a drain on jobs in some ways? You know, that the Democrats want to argue that, it, you know, ultimately it, it's good jobs, but, you know, you, you got to prove that in some fashion. So for, I'll just give an example. Um, in the last gubernatorial campaign, I was uh, on, in this debate in Grundy where uh, McAuliffe and um, Youngkin were squaring off. Yeah. And it's a long way away from Richmond, you know, it's like a two day drive. It's like a three day <laughs> effort to be there to ask two questions in an hour. Um, and, um, you know, so they asked this question about, you know, the environment and coal and all of this. And McAuliffe just talked about green jobs. And, and the dilemma is that a lot of people don't believe that yet. <laughs> you know, the, in those areas, they don't believe it. They haven't seen them. They don't believe it. They, they are coming. I mean, that, that, that some of these jobs that they're going to get are going to be green jobs. But at the moment, they don't necessarily see it. Nor, for example, you know, where where's the public on this when the issue becomes your gas is, you know, it's costing you $100 to fill up your gas tank. <laughs> um, which, which has more, which has more power in driving people um to an election driving the people who make a difference to the election so that that's the challenge that the environmentalists have faced i think they i think overall they they they've made progress over 20 years 
but I don't see it as the um, as the issue that's driving campaigns right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So Jennifer, do you feel like your question was answered or do you, do you want to restate it? Well, I just, um, I mean, you had talked about the idea that Republic, that Democrats don't really have a good uh, record in, in getting our message across. Um, so, and, the, and you just answered uh, John and saying that, that the environment is not an issue that, that is um, and it's something that we can hang our hat on. What issue could Democrats hang their hat on that would get people engaged? Well, I mean, I think, um, I didn't say, I don't think the environment is the single issue. I mean, I think the environment has a, is, is not a bad issue for them necessarily. Um, as I said, and I think, it, I think it's very important with young people. I mean, I, I, I was struck, I would just say years ago, I was working with Gene Trani on this Richmond's future thing. And we would, we, we gave some public presentations on where we were and all the young people came out and said, you know, we need much more on the environment and green stuff than is in here. Um, so, and Thad probably hears that from his students uh, on that front. However, you know, to get back to get back to the question about where they can engage, I mean, I think it's around basic notions of, of fairness and equity, actually, or uh, and inclusiveness. I mean, I think that's where um, a substantial portion of the public is on this. Um, I think they want um, fair. You know, if, if you take a look at you know the polling on some of these issues where Republicans stand, you know, against, they're huge. I mean, if you take a look at polling on minimum wage issues, I mean, it's off the board for people who, you know, believe in, um, you know, higher minimum wage. If you take a look at people who want, you know, some restraints on, um, you know, sort of what they consider to be inequitable practices, uh, off the board, again, uh, on that. Um, by and large, there's tremendous change on some of these issues. Uh, the, um, you know, the 20 the year change on what people think of gay marriage uh, is just, just astonishing to people who, you know, who, who watch this. So um, my sense when you, when you take a look at, when you take a look at this, there, there's plenty of places where the Democrats can do well. And my guess is that um, the Democrats still actually have an advantage in Virginia. Uh, when you take a look at the, the massive population in Northern Virginia compared to the change and add on to that, the changes that have occurred in the politics of RVA, I think the Republicans start statewide races, not necessarily all, every legislative race, but statewide races with a disadvantage. They're also, at a tremendous disadvantage with the general population in the United States. The, the, the problem is um, when you get into the elections, the electoral college system uh, that, we, that we have gives a, at least at, the, at this time, and it's, it's changed in, over history, but at this time gives a, gives a great advantage to smaller, more rural states in terms of representation. Um, they get two senators, um, the same as California, the same as New York um, in that front. So th there's, a, there's, there's a great advantage um, that the structure goes. But um, by and large, I think there is certainly a lot of opportunity for a Democratic message with, with a good messenger. Um, you know, Barack Obama was a... Um, an extraordinary messenger with, you know, and, and personally represented a uh, very big change in this country. So um, I'm not un, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that they're at this permanent disadvantage by any means. I think in Virginia, they have, a, you know, with, if they were better organized with a better message and, you know, they just happen to have this alb albatross um, that occurred with um, 
the inflation and the Afghanistan debacle uh, this summer in Virginia that cost them the gubernatorial election. But I, I'm not sure that uh, Youngkin is doing that much right now to consolidate and to expand uh, that base as he looks to um, maybe a potential vice presidential nomination or whatever is uh, his consultants think or is in his interest now. Well, th thank you so much, Bob. And we, we are at, at time here, but I really want to thank you uh, for spending your time with us. It's really a, a gift to those of us who are, you know, no secret here. We're, pretty much everyone considers himself a progressive, I believe, on the call in some sense. But it's great to have someone who, you know, has the ju 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 judicious, rigorous, political, scientific, you know, give it to mm -hmm. a great willingness to talk to us and, and, and tell us even the things we don't want to hear. But, but what I take from what you said tonight is actually not without hope, you know, so I really appreciate that. Yeah, well, I, I think, um, you know, it's one of the great things about politics is that when you think it's, uh, you know, you think you know what's going to happen, something different happens, something different occurs. So. Yeah, and, and there's, there is always a, another, you know, another day to, 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 to try to fight for. But, but again, you know, th thanks again. It's great to have this extended conversation and we hope to see all of you at, at a future conversation. And uh, and obviously, um, if you didn't listen carefully, I'll just tell you again that there's work to do. So let's go do it. Okay, thanks a lot.